So thank you very much for joining us this evening for the next CAM APS FX webinar. Please make sure that your cameras are off and you are on mute for the duration. Questions can be asked via the chat functionality. And please um, be aware that we are recording this webinar so that it can be used as a resource for those people who couldn't join us tonight and would like to watch it after the event. So we have our uh, panel today, Charlotte and Sarah, you would have uh, been familiar with if you've watched any of our other webinars, but we're delighted to have Hood with us today. He's a consultant in Manchester and also will be sharing his experience of closed loop with us. Excitingly as well, we have got uh, two people who are going to give us their points of view about living life with type 1 diabetes and being on closed loop. So you'll hear from Alicia and Joe uh, in a few slides. I'm going to hand over now to Sarah to start the webinar about uh, focusing on use of closed loop in young adults and adults. Thanks, Sarah. Great, thank you, Candice. So what we wanted to um, go through this evening was, again, we're going to run through a quick overview of the system just in case uh, others haven't um, seen any of the other webinars or um, any of the training. Just going to talk a bit about uh, the glucose targets and then minimising the burden of diabetes management with closed loop. So thinking about the ways that you can go about doing that, particularly around reducing alarm burden and how to make sure you stay in auto mode and then using closed loop to manage exercise and, and stress. So we're gonna go through a bit of that today and then again more um, on, on exercise um, in the next webinar next month as well. Thanks, next slide. So just a reminder of the system. So CAM APS uh, FX is a hybrid closed loop system. It is um, uh, an app that runs on an Android smartphone um, and it links via Bluetooth with a Dana insulin pump and a Dexcom G6, um, uh, uh, a continuous glucose monitor and um, it sends data automatically um, to Diasend um, when attached to Wi-Fi or if there's a SIM card in the phone. Thanks, Candice. So how does it work? So the system adjusts insulin delivery by turning off the pump's normal uh, basal rates and setting those to zero, at which point it, it will flash no delivery on the screen. So just a reminder for people not to be alarmed if they see it flashing no delivery, that's because it's switched off the pump's normal basal delivery, it means no basal is being delivered. And then what it does is it sends out an, uh, an extended bolus, uh, delivers an extended bolus every eight to 12 minutes, um, depending on the glucose level. Um, and a reminder that it is hybrid closed loop, it still requires insulin boluses for carbohydrates eaten. Thank you. Next slide. So just a reminder of the inputs into the system that um, make sure that you understand then what can what can be changed. Um, so the only thing um, things that we put into system to start the system is a uh, body weight and total daily dose and then the insulin sensitivity and the active insulin time are calculated by the algorithm and it learns those and predicts them as time goes on. Um, it, what it will do is it will take into account the glucose um, rises um, generally over the day in the total daily dose and, and rises in um, post-meal glucose and diurnal changes through the day and it will it'll predict and adjust um, as it goes by. Thank you, next slide. And then, the, so the things that you can adjust are very few actually in order to optimize the system. The only things that you can change are the, the carbohydrate ratios, which this, the phone reads directly from the pump and the glucose target, which is set as a default to 5.8, but then can be adjusted anywhere between 4.4 and 11. The things that don't affect the system when closed loop is in operation are the active insulin time and the insulin sensitivity and the pre-programmed basal rates. Um, like I said, the system's um, working out its own active insulin time and sensitivity based on um, the, the learning and, and what happens with the glucose levels. But obviously these things become important if the system flips back into open loop, um, in which case, you know, it would flick back into those pre-programmed basal rates for safety. Thank you, next slide. I'm gonna hand over to Hood to talk a bit about um, time in range. Thank you, Sarah. So um, <clears throat> most of you may already be familiar with the concept of time in range or sometimes known as time in target. And for those of you who are not, it is simply put the percentage of time that your sensor values are in a particular glucose range. 
there is now international standard or guidelines on what is the recommended time and range. And this is depending on the different populations of people with diabetes. So the reason this is important is because when we look at how close we perform, we use time and range as our marker, so to speak. So a time and range of 70% would be approximately an HbA1c of 7%, which is around 53 millimole per mole, or having your glucose in range about 60 to 17 hours per day. As I mentioned earlier, there are different target ranges and also different values for different populations. So for type 1 and type 2 diabetes under the age of 60, the recommendation is to have your time in range, which is 3.9 to 10.0 millimoles per liter, to be at least 70%, with minimizing hypoglycemia or time below range of less than 4% between 3.0 to 3.9, and for below 3.0 millimoles per liter to less than 1%. For older people with type 1 or type 2 diabetes above the age of 60, the focus is in avoiding hypoglycemia due to the increased risk of hypoglycemia and due to other comorbidities in this population. So here we try to aim for a timing target of 50% and minimizing hypoglycemia to less than 1%. During pregnancy, for obvious reasons, we want a tighter target glucose or target glucose range. So the target glucose here is 3.5 to 7.8 millimoles per liter, with the percentage still being 70% and the time below target of less than 3.5 being less than 4% and below 3.0 millimoles per liter being less than 1%. Now, what is important, I suppose, in the real world is to remember that for every 10% increase of your time and range, it's equivalent to an HP1C reduction of 0.5% or 5 millimoles per mole. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. I'm going to introduce Jo. Now, Jo is a very busy lady who's uh, you know working and studying and Joe, I'd just like to to find out a little bit more of you know how long have you had type 1 diabetes and what's you know what's the pros and cons of of living life with type 1. Hi everyone yeah so I've been I've been type 1 for 34 years now so I was diagnosed when I was just two years old um, I've been on various different insulins, insulin pens, and um, a few different insulin pumps as well. Um, I'm quite uh, busy in my life, really. I'm a full-time worker, I'm studying, um, and I've got two young children under six as well, so definitely keeping me busy. Um, it, it does play, it does make it quite difficult with the diabetes to try and juggle everything at the same time, but um, definitely been a bit of an advantage with using CAMAPS when I've done the trial because um, it's helped to balance out everything in my life that I'm doing really and stop it being quite so stressful. <laughs> but you said quite so, so not so stressful. What kinds of things does it help with? So it, it was nice just to be able to, because um, uh, one of the previous pumps that I had before this one, um, it was um, a closed loop as well, a hybrid closed loop, but it didn't quite give me the advantage of this one. And I was able to just kind of leave it alone and um, with the apps, just leave it and let it do its job. I found that I wasn't having to keep taking it out all the time and, and making so many adjustments. I didn't really have to touch the pump at all, actually, having it all done from my phone um, and be able to see everything on my phone was, was just so helpful. And um, just takes away some of the pressure really of being a type one diabetic. Yeah, so t kind of taking away the pressure, kind of plug and play kind of thing, getting on with your busy life. Excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, jo will be with us for the rest of the presentation, so please do ask questions. She's happy to answer questions via chat or later on um, in the Q&A session. Um, so please uh, do uh, use her as a resource. But we're going to carry on and I'm going to hand uh, back to Charlotte, am I right? Yes, yeah, thanks Candice and uh, thanks Joe for sharing that as well. So I think when we were thinking about what to cover um, in today's webinar, uh, Hood uh, really suggested the sort of balancing in the past couple of webinars we've focused quite a lot on this concept of time in range and getting the the best sort of time in range that's possible and I think what we wanted to do in this is sort of really counter that a little bit with also the reality of a lifestyle like uh, that which we've just heard of um, of Joe's where actually maintaining sort of 
a busy work life, school, college, other things, family life um, as well, with also getting the, the time in range and really sort of um, balancing those two things out. So in this graph, this is um, some information from a, a database, which is in the US. It's called the Type 1 Diabetes Exchange. And what they do is every few years, they collect information about what the mean uh, HbA1c is across people with type 1 diabetes in the US. And in the red line, they've got the HbA1c across the different A Age groups in uh, when they collected the data from 2010 to 2012. And if we think that the target is sort of somewhere between 7 and 7.5 roughly for HbA1c, we can see that most people um, are sort of slightly above the target that's ideal. Uh, and particularly in those sort of 20 to 30 really and that's probably the time when the most other things work school college etc uh, need to be balanced with with sort of reaching these glucose goals uh, and interestingly they did a more recent collection of this data 2016 to 2018 and we all think oh all the technology is getting better and better and all these things but actually they, those numbers unfortunately looked um slightly slightly worse than we would hope for and i think some of that's the nice thing about closed loop is it does some of the work for you so it's all very well having pumps and and sensors and things but you still need to put in an awful lot of input yourself so i hope that maybe the next time they do data collection with more people on sort of closed loop systems that it might start to come down that's the ideal but not at the expense of sort of taking over people's lives so i think it's just something to sort of think about but what we really wanted to think about are how to how to sort of get the most out of closed loop in terms of the quality of life benefits sort of balancing with these other challenges i think joe mentioned the nice thing about being able to do things on the phone just that kind of discretion of managing your diabetes and particularly in college being similar to peers and things and um, how to sort of cope with exercise and stress which are sometimes fortunately sometimes unfortunately uh, part and parcel of everyday life for sort of young adults and adults and thinking about engagement sort of how much engagement does there need to be with type 1 diabetes to sort of get the most out of it for you and that sort of again that balance of what's too much engagement and what's possibly not quite enough to, to get the outcomes that that you want as an individual so um, really what we're sort of thinking about today is ways to sort of try and keep towards getting that target range, but also balancing that with sort of uh, some of the real burden of managing type 1 diabetes. And I saw a really nice analogy on Twitter this week about managing type 1 diabetes being like keeping a balloon in the air all day, every day. And if there's something that can kind of maybe give the balloon a little bit of more air time and it needs less maintenance, and then really sort of using that to sort of help with mental health and, and the burden of uh, diabetes management, trying to prevent diabetes distress and, and sort of disengaging with diabetes management. So um, that's really what we're going to cover a little bit more in the next few slides. So we sort of uh, divided this up into a few sort of separate sections, um, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail. So firstly, and I think Sarah mentioned this um, a bit before about uh, alarm burden and how to optimize this. Thinking about bolus uh, behavior, everyone's an individual and how it can be uh, most optimized. Uh, ways to personalize the closed loop system. How to stay in auto mode as long as possible. So making the closed loop system do the work that it that it is quite good at doing and sort of just leaving it be um, but how to sort of keep that in action and thinking again about how much engagement is too much or, or too little so i'll hand you over now to uh sarah first i think yeah so just having a little uh, think about uh reducing the burden of alarms so i think especially if people are new to um uh, continuous glucose monitoring it, it kind of seems pretty amazing that you can switch there's all these different alarms with all these different sounds and you can have them on for all sorts of different um rise rates fall rates lows urgent lows urgent low soons all of this um and 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 what quickly happens is people um become sort of overloaded with them and then actually you start to not listen to the ones that are important so what we encourage is to minimize alarms wherever possible. The whole point of, um, or, or one of the main points of a closed loop system is to reduce the burden. So if you're constantly getting beeped and buzzed about things that actually you don't need to do anything about, then um, we, we want to reduce that. So we certainly want to reduce um, any interruptions to sleep. That's crucial. And you know you don't want to be interrupted during meetings, lessons, social activities. And we want to, to make sure that you respond to the ones that you do need to respond to. 
um, you don't want to end up resenting the devices. So the, the way we kind of approach that, if you go to the next slide, please, Candice, is to really just set alarms that you, you only want an alarm to go off if you need to do something about it, you need to take action. So what we tend to say is we, we want the ones that are for safety benefits. So the urgent low will obviously always sound that you can't turn that off 3.1, rightly so it will go off regardless of what um, else is, um, what, what um, mode your pumps on it or your phones on, even if it's on silent, it will override that. But a good one to think about is just setting the low alert um, at a level at which you have got time to take action. So if, if um, for example, you'd set the low alert at like 4.2 or 4, at the point where it goes off, what you want to do is, is have a look at the, uh, the phone on its side in the landscape mode to see what insulin has, what, what it's been doing, what the system has been doing, what insulin has been being delivered in the, the previous kind of half hour, 45 minutes. Because if your glucose has been dropping, the system's desperately trying to avoid you going low. So it would have been um, reducing and reducing potentially to nothing that insulin delivery. And you might see, look, based on the rate of fall and the, the way the arrows are pointing, you think actually, yeah, I'm just going to skim and that's fine. Or you might think, no, I need to um, probably just get in and help out here with maybe, you know, one jelly baby, two jelly babies, a small amount of carbohydrate to just help it on its way. If you're constantly getting those alarms and you're finding actually you don't need to take action because it's doing its thing, then you probably can lower the level that you've got it set at by, you know, 0.1 or 0.2 millimoles until you're at a point where it only actually alarms if there's something that you need to do action wise. Um, and higher, I, I suggest people just put the high alert on at a level where you really just want to know is there a problem with my set? Do I need to check for ketones? Other than that, uh, I wouldn't probably recommend any of the other alarms generally. I'd, I'd just say go for a lower a level that you think you might need to take action and a high, do I need to change my, um, change my set or, or check I've connected back properly after a bath or check for ketones. And you can, you can change the alarm um, pattern. So you can put alarms on, some alarms on overnight or different ones tonight, today. Um, and you can have different sounds so that the, the, the ones that are for more urgent um, problems that you, you will hear rather than having them um, others potentially set to vibrate. And just to highlight, we, we often see in the data that we get people getting a lot of alarms. So this is an example of someone who we noticed was having over 350 alarms a week, which is more than 50 a day, which is like one every, um, you know, Oh, half an hour or so which you know must just get exhausting so um you know that's definitely something that you know we want to avoid um it would, would definitely increase the burden next slide thank you i'm handing over to hood to talk us through bolus behavior thank you sarah um one thing to highlight is that being a hybrid closed loop system like many systems which are currently available at the moment that it is important to highlight that the importance of boluses as it is still plays a very critical role if you want to achieve optimal result with closed loop use. Now, the reason we know this is because a few years ago, we looked at all of our published studies using closed loop devices to try and find out what factors leads to better results. Now, as seen as this graph here, which was published uh, in that particular year, we showed that there is a direct correlation between the frequency and the effort of bolusing with time in range. So in other words, the more frequent the bolus is, the higher the time in range achieved. Now, this is due to the current limitation of subcutaneous insulin action time. Because insulin is still delivered subcutaneously, there's the delay in terms of the insulin peak action time and its mode of profile. So although the algorithm is still in the background, it still needs the user to bolus appropriately meal times so that it can mitigate any delays in the insulin action that we know happens at the moment. Now, this is important at least to show as well that to a person with type 1 diabetes that every little bit counts. If you want to get your biggest bang for buck, you will get what you put in. So if you have boluses for your meals, you will certainly achieve better glucose control. And we have the evidence to back us up here. So at least we're not just saying it without evidence. There is evidence to show that every single bolus carries with it a significant impact on the time spent in range. Now in clinical practice, in my clinic, amongst my users of the chem EPS system, they do find it not a big problem at all to give boluses because as Joe mentioned, earlier it's bolusing through their phone so there is less visibility around people not basically knowing you're actually giving something something because you're just taking your own phone out you're bolusing it through the menu and you can bolus without anyone else noticing it with as less intrusive as, as it is if as opposed to taking out a pump and trying to put it into your pump at the same time now 
On a related note, if the bolus is delivered late or is missed, it can result in immediate prolonged hyperglycemia and delayed or late hypoglycemia. Now, the first graph on the top illustrates what happens when the bolus is delayed. The glucose level immediately starts to go up once the meal has started. And then what happens, closer tries to mitigate the rise by increasing the amount of insulin, as you can see on the line beneath it. Now, the amount of insulin that closer gives is going up, but because of the delay of insulin action, glucose still goes high, at least in the initial stage. Later on, when the person boluses, as you can see in the arrow saying bolus delivered, the amount from the bolus will compound the effect of what the insulin has already been delivered by the closed loop system, thereby leading to a delayed hypoglycemia, as you can see in the red circle there. Now, bear in mind that the hypoglycemic event still occurred, even though the closed loop algorithm has completely suspended any further insulin delivery. Again, this is because of the delayed action of insulin. It is still not enough to prevent a hypoglycemia, especially if a bolus is given late. The second and the third graph shows when there is missed boluses. The second graph is the sensor glucose, and the third graph is the insulin delivered by the algorithm. Now, again, the algorithm tries to compensate by increasing the amount of insulin it delivers, but because of the delay in insulin action, the person spends nearly two hours after each meal with high glucose levels. In the future, ultra-rapid acting insulin may provide a solution. Now, some of you already know that we have FIASP, which is ultra-rapid aspart or Novarapid, and we also have Lumjef now, which is the ultra-rapid version of Lispro or Humaloc. Now, our group and others have published the use of FIAS with closed loop, and su the results suggest that using FIAS with closed loop can help further reduce the risk of hypoglycemia when compared to normal rapid-acting insulin. The use of Lumjef in closed loop at the moment is still being studied. My, my hope and patients as well hope that in the future we'll have insulin which are much, much more faster that we can finally use closed loop as the fully closed loop system, which means no need for bolusing before meals or during meals. But at the moment, again, due to the limitations of currently available insulins, there is still a need to give insulin boluses at meal times. Um, next slide, please. Now, one of the unique features of the CAM APS system compared to other closed loop systems which are currently available is the ability for the person to set their own personal glucose target. The default glucose target of the CAM APS algorithm is 5.8 millimoles per liter. However, this is adjustable at different times of the day and or night according to what the individual wishes it to be. Now, this is adjustable between the glucose levels of 4.4 at the lower range to 11 millimoles per liter at the upper range. Now, I find this feature particularly helpful with my own clinical practice as it allows the individual greater flexibility when using it, especially in specific group of patients. I have certain groups of patients in my clinic who have profound fear of hypoglycemia. So in order to get their confidence in using a system, sometimes they are uncomfortable in using a system where the target glucose is 5.8 millimoles per liter. They may think it's too aggressive that they cannot live with having a glucose that, that's, that to them is very low. So we can start with a more conservative target glucose, say, for example, around 8 or 9 millimoles per liter. So that will help them gain their confidence in using a closed loop system because this is how we get people to use closed loop successfully. Next slide, please. Um, there is also an important bit to remember that using closed loop in auto mode, the more you use it in auto mode, the more time in range you actually achieve. And one of the way we try to encourage people to be in auto mode most of the time is to ensure that they are using the Cam APS app on their main phone rather than a separate device. As I alluded to earlier, when one is using the closed loop on their main phone, bolusing is much easier. So that is essentially how you can encourage people to bolus much more frequently on the Cam APS system. But also, it also ensures that they're also so keeping their phone within five to six millimeter of their devices. So for example, with the pump and with the sensor, which it needs to communicate by Bluetooth. So having the person using auto mode for a longer period of time will ensure that they will achieve a lower HB1C as can be seen in the first graph here and a higher time in range as can be seen in the second graph on the right. 
Um, next slide. Uh, now I'd like to, um, yeah. Oh yeah, so I think Alicia's going to um, uh, hopefully share with us a little bit about her experiences of using a closed loop system. I think um, we're really grateful to Alicia for, for joining us tonight. And I think Alicia's in a really unique position of having used closed loop uh, ever since she was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So knows nothing other than uh, closed loop in terms of her diabetes management. But maybe Alicia could tell us a little bit about her um, experiences with uh, type 1 diabetes and, and closed loop. Uh, I've been diagnosed for three years and I was on pen for two weeks while I was getting ready to do the opening trial for the study. So where you did the thing and then they split you into the two groups. But I think it's been really helpful in and like outside school because in school I don't have to necessarily like leave the room like I used to, to go do things. I can just do it all in the room and I compete with sports, so it makes it a lot easier to be able to um, like do them without having to constantly go and check. And it also limits how like obvious it looks that, you know, something's wrong because I remember having to use pens in public, people would get really judgy because they don't understand that it's not, that I'm not doing anything I shouldn't be doing. It's just all about like, just like masking it down a bit. So it's not as like out and it looks a lot more normal. That's great. I mean, are there still things that you find quite challenging despite having this sort of technology? Are the things I obviously it doesn't take type one diabetes away, but are there still things that you wish that it could do that it can't do, or things that you'd like to still improve? Um, I notice sometimes when I've been caught without like a pump battery and like when I'm out, like often at school, I'll like go in my like kit and I'll leave my pump batteries in my blazer because where I normally carry them and I'll forget them. And so then I'm stuck without a pump battery for like an hour, two hours. So that's why I, I have my pens just in case, but it's 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 never fun just to be, you know, just your pump to beep and it says no battery. And it's like, that's the one thing I've forgotten with me today. <laughs> still quite a lot of things to carry around with you and things like that isn't yeah it? so maybe getting devices that are smaller without batteries would be a good step and uh just tell us alicia what sport you do it's amazing i swim competitively but i also do dance for my one of my exams and then I also like doing hockey as well. Hockey is one of my favorite things, but I haven't been able to find time to fit it in with the swimming because the swimming is five days a week and the uh, dance coursework takes up quite a lot. So I'm hoping when I go sixth form, I can slide hockey into there a bit more than I do now. I think you need to be our resident expert on managing type one diabetes and exercise with closed loop. You've probably got more experience than uh, than anyone else I know. On on that note, actually, Alicia, because I'm um, I'm doing the next slide on exercise. Can you can you tell us how what you do for swimming? Um, or it's not the next slide, but it's a couple of slides time. Sorry, but what what do you do for swimming? How do you do you make any changes on the pump? Do you use these off? Do you just take it off? What, how do you manage manage your swimming? you go super I, early in the morning don't you yeah I make sure I'm around like 10 11 ish and if it's later on like it's an evening one I'll put ease off on for a bit but when it's five o'clock in the morning I don't fancy waking up at four to do it so I always make and I don't normally have time to eat as well so I'll drink like a hype have take a hypo treatment before I go and then just make make sure that I'm okay like okay to last me because something I don't like is having to get out and then do a hypo treatment because it takes all the energy that I would have swam with and it converts it to lift me. So I often feel like after I take one, I don't like feel great. So it's always a good thing to make sure you are high around 10, 11 mark. So then when you're exercising, you can't go that far down. You drop to about a seven and an eight. 
Okay, we'll, we'll go through a bit more um, about that in a, in a couple of other slides. But I think, Charlotte, you're um, taking the, the next slide, I think. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Alicia. That's really helpful. I think there's lots of questions about how you manage that. Um, so uh, the next couple of slides are thinking about sort of um, how much engagement do closed loop systems require. And I think for all of us working in this area, it's sort of a bit of a learning process, especially as the closed loop systems that we have available continue to sort of get better and better. We're all learning what, what's needed um, to really keep it going. And I, as I say, I think things are moving in the right direction. This um, screenshot here is taken from uh, Diasend, and this is uh, somebody who's using our uh, closed loop system, so Camo PSFX. And what you can see here is sort of um, what I would probably consider too much engagement. I think it's very difficult to say what's the right amount. It's clearly a really individual uh, sort of experience that people have. But I think where people are waking up at two o'clock, half past four, as Alicia says, you don't really want to be getting up at four in the morning to set things on a pump. So putting boost and ease off on overnight and at midnight, I think a lot of these things are quite unnecessary. You can see at the two o'clock time when boost is given, actually closed loops already ramped up to deal with that. I, I, and I think sort of the benefits of having uninterrupted sleep are far greater than this sort of small tweaking here and there. And I think arguably a lot of these interventions aren't really required. Closed loops probably already doing it. Um, so this sort of thing to me, if I see it as a healthcare professional, I just worry a little bit about the sort of burden of management uh, particularly focusing perhaps initially on on overnight uh, and starting to sort of get people's confidence that actually closed loop can can do all of this stuff for them. I think it's really challenging where people have been managing their type one diabetes for a really long time, very meticulously to sort of give over a bit of control to the closed loop system. But that's certainly something that clinically I would sort of be thinking that would be where I'd be aiming uh, to try and get somebody confident enough to allow closed loop to sort of take on some of that burden. One of the things that we've done recently, which shows in the next slide, thanks, Candice, um, is uh, we've looked at how much time people in different studies spend um, in app, we call it, so with the with the app open. And we've had a number of studies uh, recently and ongoing uh, in very young children, uh, children and adolescents, newly diagnosed uh, adolescents, adults, pregnant women and older adults over 60. And you can see here on this chart how different engagement is amongst these different sort of cohorts in our studies. Now, this isn't real world experience, this is studies, but these are quite long studies, so it tends to be relatively reflective of what's happening in the real world and you can see in the yellow bars how long people spend uh, sort of managing their diabetes in the daytime and at night time and of course this includes all the boluses and and uh, entering the carbs as well as things like ease off and boost and starting new sensors responding to alarms and things so in the daytime in the very young children and the older adults people are spending almost an hour in app every day sort of managing diabetes whereas in the uh, young adults and adults uh, spending about sort of 15 minutes per, per day uh, in app. Pregnant women slightly more and again as Hood mentioned earlier it's slightly uh, tighter targets so people are really trying to get very tight glycemic control throughout pregnancy and what's quite nice for us to see is the the lack of burden overnight so in the children and adolescents newly diagnosed adolescents adults and pregnant women people are spending sort of one to two minutes overnight in the app which I think is a brilliant sort of marker of success it's still quite well, higher than I would like to see in sort of very young children and older adults, sort of not five to 10 minutes. And I think the more we can get this, these times down whilst maintaining good glucose control is really where we want to be heading. So this is just um, recently sort of uh, recent data that we've been looking at, but I think it's really interesting in terms of how people use the app. And as I say, it's very individualized. So it's difficult to say what's too much or too little. As little as you can get away with whilst getting the results that you want, I think is probably the right amount, but it's certainly individual. So I think this is on to me, just having a little think about exercise. And we are going to talk more about exercise in the next webinar, kind of going to focus on that much more. But just um, in terms of thinking of, of um, how you, we can reduce burden again with activity, it's um, exercise is really diff difficult. You'll all know that. And it's, it's, you know, very individual. So there's no kind of 
hard and fast rules there's some there's some guides and then it's very much taking something trying it seeing if it works for you for different scenarios and working from there a couple of the things that tend to not work is pre-exercise carb loading um when you're um attached to the system so one of the things alicia was saying was and um, before she gets in the pool she'd have taken the pump off and then probably given um some extra carbohydrate in that situation and that's fine because she's not got the the the, the system running, delivering lots of extra insulin in response to the glucose rise that would have would have come from um, taking some additional carbohydrate uh, in advance. But generally, if you're keeping the system on, then pre-exercise carb loading is not going to be helpful because the glucose will rise and the system will ramp up to um, provide extra insulin to, to, to um, in response to that rising glucose. And then you end up with lots of glucose in the system just at the time when you start to exercise and are going to be more sensitive to that insulin. So what we found with closed loop is it's it's better to drizzle in insulin um, as required, um, and and sorry, drizzle in carbohydrate, not insulin. Drizzle in carbohydrate is required if you need to during um, exercise. And depending on depending on the type of exercise you're doing, it might be that you can you find actually just utilizing the ease off function, ideally ninety minutes before um, the uh, exercise if it's planned. Um, having it running during the exercise and potentially having it on as well for a bit of time after will um, will be enough alone. But for people who are doing um, exercise of, of that's more intense potentially or um, of longer duration, then they might find that they need a mixture of using the ease of function and drizzling in additional carbohydrate as they go. Um, just one of the things to, to mention that the ease off can be pre-programmed in advance. So something Alicia could do if she chose to is, is set it potentially to, to when she goes to bed at night to set ease off to come on at kind of four o'clock in the morning so that at five it's it's been running by the time running for a, a while and when she gets in the pool it's she has the the effects of of having had less insulin delivery in that period before she before she gets in the pool. Um, the um, people who do kind of quite intense exercise and for a long duration can actually find that coming out of auto mode is the best way to manage that situation and there's nothing wrong with that it's not kind of you know a badge of honor to, to try and sort of make sure you never come out of auto mode and you spend you know 100% of the time in, in auto mode if actually for your particular type of exercise you find that um, putting uh, coming out of auto mode and using the pump as you would have done potentially pre um, closed loop in you know really making a much bigger reduction in the um, uh, the basal insulin level, so you might find actually you just want thirty percent of your normal basal insulin, whereas actually ease off probably only reduces it by about thirty percent down to about thirty percent in in total. It's not so cut and dried in that because it's taken into account other things like your sensitivity and active insulin time at that time of day. But um, it certainly you would find that um, putting a, a, a reduced temporary basal on of kind of of, of less than that with with a normal pump running. Um, might be something that would work. So it's, we'll think about that more um, next month when we talk about those. And sometimes people might need to completely suspend insulin delivery for some types of cardiovascular exercise and that works quite well for them. So it's very much looking at kind of um, starting with something, trying something and then individualizing it. And especially if you're finding you're, you're wanting to exercise for a particular reason, like you might be wanting to exercise for weight control. And if you find you're constantly having to drizzle in carbohydrate and actually, you know, you're, you're having more calories than you're burning Burning off, then that's not something that you know that that would be annoying. Um, and it's looking to okay, this isn't working for me doing it this way. I'm not low, but actually I'm having to have extra carbohydrate. Is there a way that I can make different adjustments in in and 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 be able to avoid that? So, and that's something we'll go through more next time. Just I think the next slide just talks about um, ease ease off. Um, so just as a reminder, it substantially reduces the insulin delivery. It raises the glucose target temporarily, and it will um, avoid giving additional insulin if the glucose is below seven millimoles. So definitely, if possible, trying to utilize it before um, activity, ideally uh, sort of 60 to 90 minutes before remembering that the insulin that's going into you now will be having its biggest effect in 60 to 90 minutes time. But clearly life gets in the way and things happen and that's not always possible and people don't remember and those sorts of things. So having the, the ability to preset it can be really useful for some people. And it can be good just actually if you've, if you've had a run of hypos or you know sometimes we find when the weather changes and it's a bit hot, we'll get people ringing up to clinic saying that there's like a, they've, they've just been struggling with, with hypoglycemia you can find 
and just actually, do you know what, running ease off for the whole day and just saying kind of to the system, back off, actually, you've been a bit too aggressive. I just want to take a breath and not have any more dips. Um, that can be useful as a, a useful um, use of it as well. Next slide, thanks, which I think is handing back to Hood. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, from a human perspective, I think one of the biggest challenge and one of the things that many people know is underappreciated in clinical practice and in real life is the stress that people have depending on whether their stress is because of their diabetes or not because of the diabetes. But one of the commonest questions I get in clinic is usually, does stress affect my blood glucose? And most people will already know the answer themselves because if they're wearing a glucose sensor, for example, they can tell the difference of how the glucose levels may react when they're stressed versus when they're not stressed. Now, there are many forms of stress that can affect someone's glucose levels. It can be physical stress, it can be emotional stress. For example, this can come from work-related stress or college exam stress, interpersonal relationships with families and friends, the psychological burden of living with diabetes, and of course, the biological and clinical factors such as being unwell or ill, periods, and disturbed sleep, which is another under-recognized issue towards poor glucose control. But what these all have in common is that stressors, no matter whether it's physical or emotional, can cause disturbance in a person's counter-regulator hormone levels, such as their adrenaline and cortisol levels, which clinically leads to increased insulin resistance and hyperglycemia. Now, unfortunately, unlike, for example, meal-related hyperglycemia, where you know hyperglycemia will occur due to carbohydrate intake, stress-related hyperglycemia is unpredictable. And because it's unpredictable, it's very difficult to manage yourself day by day. Now, there's a very good publication done by Adam Brown on the right-hand side there, which uh, he's a person living with type 1 diabetes, and he states that there are at least 42 factors affecting our glucose levels, some of which we can try try to account for, but there are others which we currently can't. So the challenge is really understanding that there are certain things you can control for, for example, meals, et cetera, where you know can cause high glucose levels, but there are other factors where we either can't measure it properly or we still don't understand how it affects glucose levels, which is why people see the peaks and troughs of hyper and hypoglycemia, which frustrates people living with type 1 diabetes. The challenge really and the key point here is trying to strike a balance between achieving a better glucose control, achieving better time and range whilst minimizing hypoglycemia, but at the same time maintaining your sanity and your mental health. Now, with closed loop, next slide, please. One of the advantages, the algorithm will try and compensate the changes in your physiological insulin requirements in real time, as mentioned by Sarah early on, based on your sensor glucose values and the amount of insulin already delivered. But a unique feature of the CAM APS system is the ability to give a, uh, an extra amount of insulin by 35% or instructing, telling the algorithm to be a bit more aggressive. This is the contrast or the opposite of ease off. So this is essentially useful when you're trying to tell the algorithm, my body is a bit more insulin resistant during this particular period than usual. So for example, I've had a large fatty meal in the evening where I know it takes a long time for the meal to be absorbed and my glucose will go up and up and up overnight. Or if I'm during my pre-menstrual period or I'm having a low-grade illness, a bit of an illness, a bit of a flu, where my body's a bit more insulin resistant compared to usual, but you don't need to do the full day sick day rule. So if you do, you need to come out of close loop, but this is for low-grade illness where you want the algorithm to be about 35% more aggressive. Now it is safe because once the glucose reaches its target value, say for example, 5.8 millimoles per liter, which is the default target, the boost will not continue to increase insulin delivered. So there's a lower risk of hypoglycemia as opposed to using a temporary basal increase on the conventional pump where the insulin will still be increased even though your insulin has already started to come down. Next slide, please. And this is uh, illustrated by this graph here, where the boost is illustrated by the red colored zone. And then the overnight period is where this person chose to use the boost. Now it might be that the person may have had a very large meal the night before, or he may be feeling a bit unwell. So he decided to use 
boost. Now, it's safe to use it overnight because as you can see, the person didn't go low because as I said earlier, once the target glucose is reached, the boost will stop providing extra amount of insulin. It will just go back to its normal way of delivering the closed loop system in delivery of insulin. So there is low risk of hypoglycemia when one is using boost as opposed to a traditional temporary basal increase. Next slide, please. So this is the kind of summary slide of the whole talk that we've presented today. So I hope that you've seen an overview of what the closed loop system is, the components, the algorithm, and how it functions. The target glucose, which can be personalized, although I do forgot to mention that apart from personalizing your closed loop algorithm target, you can also personalize your meal as well. So bolusing for meals, you can personalize the meal size, which we can talk a bit later on. The idea of how we can hopefully help minimize the burden of diabetes management with closed loop. And as Sarah illustrated, one of the important bits to understand is alarms are useful, but at the same time, it can be a nuisance. So how do we encourage people to reduce the alarm burden so that they can use the alarms more effectively without it interfering with their daily lives? And as I mentioned as well, the importance of staying in auto mode, because the longer you stay in auto mode, the more benefits you will get in closed loop. And the strategies that you can use to stay in auto mode, for example, having it on your main phone. And one of the advantages from the KMAPI system is the system's designed to stay in auto mode as long as possible. It doesn't kick you out if your glucose is going too high or too low. It stays in auto mode unless you physically stop using it. And Finally, as Sarah mentioned briefly about the ability to use closed loop to manage exercise and what I mentioned with stress as well, stress hyperglycemia. Um, these are all important factors because although the technology is there, we need to try to help people use the system more effectively so that it supports them rather than it tries to drive them mad basically from using the technology. So we want to be able to help people use the system effectively and for them to be happy using the system in their daily lives. And next slide. So this is uh, for Candice. Yes, thank you very much. We're gonna go into a question and answer session now. Um, but just while you think of any last questions, we've got a series that I'm gonna ask the panel, um, but any more, please type them in. These are our next webinars that we've planned. Please feel free to book into them. So next session, we're gonna concentrate very much more on tips on physical activity, meals and managing other life events with you know, how to manage those pizzas and curries and using, um, uh, you know, inviting people along to share their experience of, of managing uh, all these things on CAM APS. We're then going to go much more intensely into quality of life um, and closed loop um, for the next one. And then finally, looking at long standing diabetes, managing diabetes for a long period of time, and potentially people may have developed complications, how the closed loop works in that setting. Great, so I can see all the questions. So I am going to um, put us all on screen now um, and bring us up and then we can um, ask some questions. So the first question I've got on the system is around um, looking at the ultra rapid insulins. We've got a few questions about that and maybe Hood, this one's aimed for you, sorry. Um, aimed for you around looking at, um, would you recommend it as an option? Thank you. So this is a question and the question is, I've been using Novrapid with the APS system, time in which is 85 to 89%. So first of all, congratulations. That is extremely great. I mean, a time in range of 85 to 89% is excellent. Now the question is wondering if FIAS might be a better option based on your update. To be very honest, I think once you reach a threshold of a time in range that is as high as yours, which is 85 to 89%, there is anecdotal evidence and the studies where they use say FIAS, for example, in pumps shows improved time in range, or sorry, improved post meal glucose, but not necessarily improved time in range. And in the study that I just mentioned, which uh, Charlotte and the group has published as well, is that it minimizes hypoglycemia or the risk of hypoglycemia. So 
at your level of time and range of 85 to 89 percent, I'm not sure if it will provide any further increment in terms of your time and range. If you have a problem with immediate postprandial hyperglycemia or delayed hypoglycemia, provided that your bolus timing is correct and the ratio is all fine, maybe. But I think at this stage, if you're achieving a time and range of 80 up to 89 percent with minimal hypoglycemia and you're using Novarapid effectively, I would stay on Novarapid, honestly, because you're obviously achieving the optimal glucose target already. And there is some anecdotal evidence that some people find that FIAS after a period of time becomes less effective, although we don't know for sure if this is true or not. But some of my patients have found that they revert back to Novarapid after being on FIAS for a while. I don't know whether others have other, uh, other, questions, other um, information to share. Yeah, I sometimes think it's worth a try just for a, a period of time and see if it makes a difference. It, I think most people are happy to prescribe it. Costs the same, doesn't it? I, I agree with you, Hood. I think it's unlikely to be a life-changing difference, but if it's it, sometimes it's it's worth a try of these things, isn't it? I, hopefully, some of the newer insulins as well, uh, even even quicker than Fias. So things are moving in the right direction, aren't they? Yes, um, I have. A f Sorry, go ahead. Then go for it. I mean, I do have two patients using Lumjef uh, on the um, on the APS system. And anecdotally, they do report they have noticed much better time and range. Um, now, depending on how your starting baseline time and range is, they have noticed better time and range and also much better post-meal glucose. So they're not having the spike that they were seeing, especially at breakfast time, because a lot of people struggle with the post-breakfast spike. And no matter what they do, they sometimes find it challenging to tweak their cut ratio to make it flatter. So with Lumjef, they appear to have achieved that and they're happy with it. So. On that note, can Lumjef be used in children? No, it's, it's not licensed in paediatrics at the moment. I mm. think there's a big study happening in the US as we speak, but at the moment it, it hasn't received US license and it's not CE marked in paediatrics. I think some people are using it off license, but mm. yeah. FIASP is. And then we've got a question about uh, Bluetooth and, you know, Bluetooth dropouts. What is the sort of um, connectivity between the, or, or the quality of connectivity between the pump and the app and um, the CGM for CAM APS? So, I mean, it's uh, in terms of the CGM, it's pretty much the same as with Dexcom. It uses the same uh, receiver uh, as, it, as the Dexcom app does. So I think that's no different. Some of the things that we uh, notice is uh, if there's lots of other Bluetooth devices, uh, I think that's a pretty standard thing that can cause problems with uh, connectivity. One of the nice things I think about the uh, app is that actually it will continue in auto mode without sensor data for up to about uh, sort of half, an, around about half an hour. So those small interruptions are mostly annoying because some people set an alarm for a CGM um, uh, sort of uh, dropout, but actually often you'll find that closely it will continue to run until it picks up again. So that, and that's why as Hood was saying, we, you can run sort of auto mode 90, 95% of the time, just because it will continue. If glucose levels are stable, it might even go on longer than that. It's just, uh, so those small interruptions tend not to have a big impact. It's more the alarm. <laughs> and on, on that note, Charlotte, I think the default set for the sensor signal loss alarm is about 20 minutes and it's definitely worth and we're thinking about the alarms um extending that a bit because you you don't like charlotte said it might well continue to run probably will run for at least that that amount of time so you, you kind of don't want to know about it until maybe you could change it to 40 minutes or even an hour after that time yeah you might want to know if it's not uh, if it's not picked up the signal again but 20 minutes is definitely probably too short and that'll again be an alarm that you just don't don't want to get so you can extend those as well in the alarm setting part of the menu. Thank you. There was a question about you can pre-program ease off to, to sort of for exercise. Can you pre-program it to drop out of um, closed loop into open loop to sort of prepare for exercise? No, sorry, you can't. Huh. That's a good Wait. question. I mean, I have people who, um, who do. Yeah, you can see why you'd want to. Yes, exactly. Well, I, 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 
you can for certain individuals in certain situations. I think it's relative. I, I'd be interested Rare. to know how often it would be actually used. Uh, but, and then the worry is that it accidentally goes on and people drop out when they didn't want to. Morning run. So, you know, normally needing to drop out. And then so in that circumstance, would you set maybe ease off for a longer period of time to to sort of r start running higher and then drop out when they wake up and go off for their run? Would that would that maybe be a solution? I yes. normally tell yeah, I normally tell my patient to try themselves experiment because to be honest, exercise is one of those variables we have very little understanding still. And I think people can experiment themselves. I do, as Charlotte said, I would try to encourage them to try it with the system first, try and ease off as early as possible so that they're monitoring on board as little as possible. Um, I think these are mainly individuals who do I would say extreme sports. I mean, I have one or two individuals who are very, um, who do long distance running or who are very much rigorous in their training regime and they want to be in control. So I think it's sometimes the control bit that they like, uh, you know, although they understand that the benefit of close loop is there, that the algorithm will compensate, will try to reduce the amount of insulin delivered at all times. Um, so I always try to be able to tell people to try it first before they try it without it. Great, thank you. There's a question about uh, being on closed loop for a period of time. And then, um, you know, as the system learns and adjusts, it's going to, you know, increase its total daily dose or whatever, but the pre-programmed basal on the pump won't be adjusted. So is there a way that you can look at the total daily dose and then look back at the basals and update the basals to sort of keep them uh, sort of up to speed as time goes on? I think there's no quick way of doing it. I think it is worth just comparing your uh, total basal dose that you've got on the pump with the total basal amount that closed loop's giving. It's worth just bearing in mind that the total basal closed loop is given is usually higher because it will mop up any of the highs that might happen because of sort of erroneous carb counting or things like that. But I think as a ballpark, if you look whether the total sort of daily dose is, is within the range, what you're not gonna be able to do is get a really clear pattern of where should be less or more with the basal rates. I think what we tend to do in particularly some of our longer studies is, is almost go back to a bit of a flat basal, which you think will just about be okay for that short period of time of a sensor warm up. I think trying to go with an exact science is, is probably not enough gain for the amount of time it will take you um, personally. That's my experience, but I don't know if the others have anything to say. I agree. I think the basal to basal equivalence is not there because essentially, as Charlotte said, the, the way the close loop works is it's mopping up everything in the background. So you will inevitably end up with a higher basal amount on close loop, but that's not necessarily what your usual pump will need. So I would be careful with trying to do that direct translation. The total daily insulin, as Charlotte mentioned, is probably better, but then you don't know where, which time of the day your basal needs to be increased or decreased. Okay, thank you. Um, Joe, if you don't mind, I'd like you to um, answer this question. There's about a, a question about gastroparesis and is the system safe? What's your experience, Joe? You're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so it's quite new to me. I was only diagnosed in November last year, um, but I was diagnosed with severe gastroparesis, so um, it's it's been quite a challenge um, I didn't find that my previous pump really coped with it very well um, but starting on the cam apps um, and going into auto mode on it um, I've actually noticed it copes with it quite well actually because I've, I actually sometimes don't I'm not able to give the full amount of insulin with my food um, especially not all in one go so sometimes I've just given some of it and kind of seen how it's gone and just sort of watched and monitored it to see how it, it copes with it. And it seems to stop me spiking too high, but then I'm not dropping either because I'm, I'm not having too much insulin all in one go, but it seems to just on its own manage it quite well and, and manage the, um, the variations in it, which has been quite a struggle since I've been diagnosed, I must admit. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Does anybody else want to say anything about gastroparesis on the panel? I'm just aware of time and we've got a couple more questions we want to get squeeze in 
I'm Candice, I have a question that was sent to me privately, but she's happy to have it um, discussed in public. So I'll, I'll just let you answer the other questions first, because um, this is a question from Germany, two questions from Germany. Okay. Um, so the difference between Dana RS and Dana I, because they're both pumps linked with CAM APS, what are the pros and cons between the two pumps? Um, the, the only real change um, is the fact it takes a, a AAA battery instead of the, the normal um, kind of bespoke batteries that the Dana RS uses. So it's, you know, it was easier to get hold of the batteries. Um, and for that reason, it is slightly heavier and, the, and they've changed the casing to kind of fit that. So the casing kind of is, is a little bit, looks a little bit more robust. I think the main difference is, whereas the, uh, the RS has the set time blocks, the morning, afternoon, evening, night time blocks for the carb ratios and the correction factors, the Dana I, uh, the Dana I has, um, uh, the, you can adjust those time blocks to whatever suits. So although the RS time blocks don't tend to cause too much trouble, the main groups we find is sometimes kind of school children find that they need a different carb ratio for breakfast than they do for like a mid-morning snack at school in the same time, sort of later in the afternoon, they need a different one for lunch and they do for like a snack when they get home from school and you can't change that on the RS um, and you can on the I. So that's that's the main differences. There's also a slightly different um, way to it Bluetooth across your um, amount of insulin that you've loaded your cartridge with rather than you having to enter it manually. But apart from that, it's, it's the same. Thank you. So there's there's a question about, uh, you know, different days. So if your week split in half and you've got some working days and some not working days and and she, uh, this person tends to find their hypo when they're not working, I think, um, and, and kind of not showing when to use ease off or let the system just ride. What's your experience? Yeah, I think it's challenging. I think in, depending on what, whether you've used a closed loop system before or not, I think closed loop will often manage very high day to day variability of insulin requirements. I think that's one of the benefits of having what we call a glucose responsive system. So I think in the first instance, I wouldn't do anything unless this is a, an issue that persists, even with a closed loop system, because uh, I think closed loop can really help with this, which I think is really common. I think if it does still happen, putting ease off on the whole time is probably maybe more labor intensive than I would maybe think about increasing the target your personal glucose target on days that you're not working maybe pop it up to 7.5 just to try and minimize those hypos you can then leave it on that for for the whole day you just have to remember to switch it sort of on or off on a working day which is possibly a bit less of a burden than swinging ease off on the whole time but as I say I would hope that perhaps the closed loop system could cope with that sort of variability and I'd certainly be trying that in the first instance. Thank you. Okay we've got somebody who's got going to have two children at the same time on the CAM APS. Um, oh, how will the system cope with that? So separate. It should, yeah it should be yeah. fine. So, so it's, they're separate. I, I'm assuming it's two apps. So the apps are separate. They they learn about you, not about somebody else. Is that right? Yeah, and maybe the the worry is about kind of connectability, but the the pairing is specific to the particular transmitter or the particular pump. So it's not like like one's going to get attached to the wrong pump or or that kind of thing, as long as they don't pick up the wrong phone. Yeah, um, bolusing. Give, off, give the other one a bolus. <laughs> phones for different children. I don't know what yeah, age they sure. are, but yeah, <laughs> twelve and six. So making sure that yeah. twelve year olds not annoyed with the little sibling. <laughs> yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah, that would make me slightly anxious about the phones, I think. I'd probably get very different type of phones, but yeah. Cover or something like that. Yeah, just yeah. Sure. But once it's paired, it's, it's a very safe, very secure pairing. It's not yeah. like being at the gym and somebody, you know, the machine next door to you picking up your heart rate monitor. Uh, no. you know, it's definitely a very secure pairing. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, now I've only got, because we're running over, two more questions. Hood's question and then this one. Um, so one of the questions is about... Um, uh, two questions actually they've been on cam APS for two months never less uh, never less than approximately two weeks per month her time in range is about 75 percent and there's about two weeks per month that they've got lots of lows and highs and time in range is about 60 percent um, you know 
it, it, you know, is this hormones? Is this, you know, what's the reason for, you know, that that these sections of time are, are so different with the same system? No, I was looking at that and I the thing that jumped out at me is that I wonder whether it's more the hypos that then cause this sort of, we often see it like a bit of a roller coaster. I think the problem with the hypos is after the hypo, you've got the hypo treatment, plus you've got, as had mentioned, all the counter-regulatory hormones that you then become a bit more insulin resistant. I would probably prioritize getting rid of those hypos. So maybe even during that time, raising the personal glucose target a little bit, ease off. I think if you focus on... A, sort of trying to reduce the hypos the highs will take care of themselves and then that you wouldn't get such dramatic swing that was just how I sort of read the question I don't know if other people had any and then you know it's a 10 year old so growth hormones spurts or anything like that yeah there are, yeah lots of different hormonal inputs that could um can make a difference they d tend to cause sort of more persistent hyperglycemia or insulin resistance whereas that sort of roller coaster I think is often hypo related but um yeah I mean the one thing we didn't talk about which is uh, also quite useful to know is what is the variability of glucose in that particular individual so there is um a marker called coefficient of variation, which is sometimes used. So if your coefficient of variation is above 30%, then it means that you are someone with high glucose variability, which as Charlotte suggests, is somebody who has this kind of roller coaster. Because having a time in range of 60% may suggest that the other remaining 40% might be predominantly hyper or predominantly hypo or a mix of both. So really just understanding which one is which. And if you think it's to do with the coming periods, then you might be right in some ways. If you see a pattern, let's say a few weeks or a week before periods that this is starting to have a glucose rise, then go with your instinct initially saying, okay, I can see this happening. I'm going to use boost. But at the same time, as Charlotte mentioned, it's also important to minimize hypoglycemia as well and trying to identify whether hypoglycemia is a result or is causing this hyperglycemia at the same time. Um, Candice, this is actually the question from uh, Germany. So yeah, we're okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's been a little bit of chatter around um, data visibility and, you know, Dexcom follow, Clarity, how do you use Diasyn? Do you want to take this um, sort of quickly about how people can access the data and when Clarity and follow, Dexcom follow are coming? Sarah, that's your favourite question. Yeah, it's a really commonly asked question and, and we're as frustrated as everyone else. I think... Um, uh, Dexcom are working really hard on, on sorting it out for us, but everything kind of ended up getting delayed with COVID last year. We'd hoped it was going to come online in the autumn, and then we were told sometime in the new year in their first quarter, but we are getting towards the end of their first quarter, and um, and it hasn't happened yet. So all I know is it's soon, and as, as soon as we know, we will, we will let um, any users know. Um, in the meantime, um, the the best way to to follow is obviously you've got the alerts and alarms if you've got the SMS uh, text alerts if you've got a SIM card in the phones, um, or um, you can um, use the Diasend app which you um, download and log in with the same username and password for the the Diasend account that's linked in that user one um, Diasend in the shares menu, and that person that's got then that Diasend app can see um, the glucose level. It isn't quite real time, but as long as the phone is connected to Wi-Fi or has um, a SIM and has 4G, then the data is, you know, pretty much there or thereabouts. And you also can see the, the insulin delivery from the system on, on Diasend as well. So it's a good, it's a good um, way to view the data. Excellent. Well, thank you. I think I've handled all the questions. If I... Yeah, just one more. Can they just a very quick one? one. Yes. Um, I think the question here is how do we deal with occasional pizza and barbecue and other fat and protein rich meals? We see that the algorithm is not able to follow up on the usual, on unusual fat protein units in reasonable time. What are we supposed to do? I, I would say for this, it's not a particularly quick answer, so I'll try and do it quickly. Is I would use those kind of three pronged approach. The first thing I would do is just. Um, if you would normally have split the bolus, um, if you would have done a dual wave previously with a pump or you would have split the bolus with pens, I would start with going for the percentage that you would have given up front on the bolus calculator um, and um, give that. So say you're having 100 grams of carbs but, and you would, would normally have given 70% up front, then I would put 70 grams of carbs in the bolus calculator and then initially see what the glucose, um, see what the system does to deal with the additional glucose as it comes through. If that doesn't work out, 
then look and see, did you have a, a big peak from that uh, initially? Do you need more upfront? Do you need 80% upfront? Um, and would that would that work better next time? Or it might be that you do a, a you put you put the percentage in upfront, the 70% upfront, but then you also set boost to run either from the time that you actually give the bolus to the um, the maybe four to six hours afterwards, as we saw before, you can leave it on, it won't keep boosting if you're um, if you go below target. Or um, you might want to um, preset boost to come on kind of an hour after that bolus, and that might work quite nicely depending on on the type of meal. There is a new um, functionality that um, is on the latest version of the app. So for those of you who haven't um, updated yet, the update that came out maybe on Tuesday, I think it was yesterday, or I don't know which day it is today, Monday or Tuesday, is version 117. And if you look on your um, add meal section in the drop down menu, you'll see it used to just have a box to tick if it was hypo treatment that you've put, put additional carbohydrate in for. But now there's another box that says for slowly absorbed meals. Now, um, this, is a, this is kind of based on research that was done year, a long time ago when we were the app was in development or the system was in development and uh, there was lots of studies that were done looking at um, absorption of, of different types of um, high fat um, and, and low fat meal uh, carbohydrate based meals. And um, so from that, um, this function has been added in whereby if you give your bolus upfront normally, so your 70% upfront normally with the bolus calculator as you would do, but then what you can do is put that additional 30 grams, you can go to add meal, put the 30 grams of carbs in there and tick that it's slowly absorbed and then the system will deliver insulin in a slightly different way for it. It will, it will use your carb ratio but it will spread it out over a period of time I think delivering extra kind of every roughly every half an hour for a period of three or four hours um, and so we'll be honest we haven't seen it working yet because it literally just went on the the latest version so um, any feedback if anyone's keen to give it a try would be would be useful and again with all these things everyone absorbs food at different rates so it depends um, you know you need to try something write it down make a note of what it was did it work didn't it work a bit like the exercise and think right, what will I try next time until you kind of work out a, a plan to get it right for those meals? Yeah, I've had two people feedback already, quite positive, um, you know, it's better than what they were doing. So, you know, any any changes, any feedback, please, please yeah, do let us know. Me so we can learn and also, you know, just how the splits work and things like that. So I think we've I've done a terrible job. We're 15 minutes almost over. So apologies, everyone. But I think it was really great to have those nice discussions around those questions. Thank you, everyone, for providing those questions. Uh, thanks to the panel and a super big thanks to, to Joe and to Alicia for being here with us and, and sharing those pearls of wisdom and just, you know, being um, available, especially at this time of night where, you know, family and, and, and commitments go as well. So thank you everyone and have a great evening. Uh, enjoy the rest of the night and we will see you next month for the next session to talk more about carbs and exercise and all of this exciting stuff. So thank you very much. Goodbye everyone. <laughs>